Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Dolores Wesson. I am the designated federal officer for this committee. Uh, I manage and staff uh, th this board. Um, the purpose of this meeting today is to um, uh, present the report that this committee has been working on. Um, uh, the report includes the work uh, of the committee for the entire year. It uh, has two letters of advice, a May 19 and a December 2nd letter of advice. In addition, it has 63 different recommendations in eight different chapters. So um, there are copies of the report for you outside, and I hope you will have had a chance to pick one up. Uh, normally, we publish it also in Spanish, and unfortunately, we haven't been able to uh, get it all together for you today, but we will be issuing that very shortly. We apologize for that. I want to thank the first panel um, uh, of speakers today, and that is Nancy Sutley, who will be a little bit late today. She's caught up in another meeting. She is the s chair of CEQ. I want to thank Michelle Depa, uh, the assistant administrator for the Office of International and Tribal Affairs, who is with us here today as well. And I want to thank uh, Enrique Escorza, the head of the Political Affairs Office at the Embassy of Mexico. Uh, quisiera dar la bienvenida y agradecer la presencia en particular de nuestros compañeros mexicanos de la Embajada. Muchísimas gracias por su participación. Um, I also want to thank uh, some federal representatives that are here today with us as well, from DHS, Teresa Pullman, from NOAA, Tricia Ryan, and we also have some members of the Department of Interior and other agencies, which I don't know uh, personally, but I look forward to meeting you later at the reception. Um, uh, thank you for being here as well. Um, our first panel uh, uh, will be uh, presenting to you uh, their personal views on this report and some of the other issues related to, to this important um, event. Uh, at the end of that, we will take one or two rounds of questions, and we would like to ask all of you uh, to keep those questions to issues that are germane to, to the scope of the report. Um, there are many different issues in this report, so uh, they should be uh, sufficient for a lively discussion. Our second panel will be moderated by Duncan Wood, who is over here with us. Um, and the panel will consist of a number of stakeholders, stakeholders that are also members of this board. Um, and they will be talking about um, the different perspectives from their own particular representative sectors um, and how um, that ref is reflected or uh, affected by the recommendations in this report. So with that said, I will introduce uh, Paul Ganster to you, the chair uh, of this committee. Paul has been with this committee for six years. He has chaired this board for uh, a total of, I believe, four years. Paul is a professor at San Diego State University and well known for his expertise on border issues. He is also um, the director of the Regional Institute for the Study of the Californias at San Diego State University. Uh, so with that, I will pass on the mic to Paul, and thank you very much again for being here. I will remind you that the event is being broadcast um, uh, on the web. Um, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Dolores, and uh, thank you all for coming on, on a, a busy day when there are lots of other uh, events going on, but uh, we're delighted that, that you're here. Uh, what I would like to do is take about 10 minutes and give a quick overview of the report. Uh, many of you have copies of the report. Uh, it should be online soon or is now, uh, so you'll able, be able to review it in depth. But uh, I'd like to do that to, to get us uh, started. And um, I had it all set. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, uh, this is the Good Neighbor Environmental Board. Uh, consists of uh, appointees from border communities, uh, local, state, federal agencies, uh, and its its job is to advise the President and Congress about environmental conditions on the border with Mexico. 
And so we're all volunteers. Uh, we are an independent agency. Uh, and so uh, we, uh, we say what we think eventually. Uh, we work through a process to come to a consensus and uh, uh, we think it strengthens uh, the output that we are able to achieve. Um, on behalf of the board, I would like to thank uh, uh, a number of uh, federal partners that have been very helpful to us in our, our work. Uh, the CEQ, CEQ uh, Nancy Sutley, have facilitated our interaction uh, with the president uh, and the administration, and that's been very helpful. Uh, Michelle Depa and EPA in the Office of International and Tribal Affairs uh, has been very uh, helpful, uh, particularly in terms of leadership she's provided for the Border 2012 process with which we work uh, very closely uh, here on the board. And then finally, the Office of Cooperative Environmental Management at EPA for the support provided to EPA and uh, making all of these things uh, happen. So uh, this basic support really helps us uh, tremendously. Uh, the 13th report is uh, a comprehensive blue print on border environmental issues and was meant to, to, to be that. Uh, we list the major uh, areas of concern. Uh, uh, we do not rank them in order of importance. We feel that's really up to policy, community, and others to do. Uh, we uh, did approach the issues that we identified with the perspective that uh, there was not going to be a lot of money available to fund new programs. So we tried to look at actionable items that could be done uh, within the context of existing resources and doing things smarter, hopefully, to achieve better environmental outcomes on the border. Uh, we on the board and our report, uh, we have the advantage of bringing independent perspectives from stakeholders in all the border communities as well as federal, state, and local agencies. And so uh, we, think, we think we're giving a pretty good overview of the reality of the uh, issues. Uh, now, in the report that we've, uh, we've just uh, issued, uh, there are 63 specific and actionable recommendations that are grouped in eight thematic chapters. And there are also a number of cross-cutting themes that uh, appear at different uh, points in the report, and I'll mention all of those. Uh, here's a, a list of the, of the action items that we've identified. Uh, as you can see, we've grouped them in climate impacts, adaptation, and mitigation. Uh, air quality, uh, renewable energy, uh, water, uh, solid and hazardous waste, emergency preparedness, habitat and biodiversity conservation, and institutional mechanisms. Uh, these are themes that we've dealt with in previous reports and advice letters, so the board has accumulated a, a pretty good record over the years uh, speaking to these issues. Uh, I'd like to just touch on a few of the points in each of the areas uh, uh, while I have the opportunity here. Uh, climate, of course, uh, in the discussion about impacts, adaptation, and mitigation is really relatively new uh, to the public sector uh, in the border region, although scientists have been uh, talking about this for quite some time. Uh, w the board was most concerned about the effects of climate shifts uh, on border water and ecosystems, uh, two fairly critical areas. And uh, our major recommendation centers around the need to uh, better coordinate U.S. and Mexican uh, federal, state, local uh, efforts at adaptation, mitigation, education, and implementation uh, for the border region. The border region uh, is different. It's not like elsewhere in the U.S. It borders an international country where things are done differently, so that cross-border coordination is very critical. In terms of air quality, the board recommends uh, moving uh, forward with the creation of binational airshed management all along the border at the relevant uh, binational air basins using the model of El Paso Ciudad Juarez and extending it elsewhere. Um, 
Also, uh, it's very clear to us that reducing idling and wait times at ports of entry will have a very positive effect on air quality in many border communities. Uh, the long waits uh, produce significant amounts of contaminants as well as greenhouse gases, and so this is a win-win situation where we can improve the environment and improve the efficiency of, of commerce. Um, we also looked briefly at renewable energy. We feel there's tremendous uh, potential in the border region for uh, renewable energy, for solar, for wind. Uh, however, uh, because of the political geography of the border, we feel that coordination uh, with Mexico of regulations and a trans-border effect assessment uh, of resources, production, and transmission are desirable in order to move ahead efficiently and to accomplish what needs to be done in the best way. Um, we also um, call for federal regulation in the U.S. and incentives to uh, encourage uh, residential and commercial renewable energy and energy efficiency in border communities, which is badly needed. Uh, we have a lot of inefficient use of energy uh, in the border region. Um, in terms of water, uh, I previously mentioned the issue of uh, long-term climate shifts and uh, water supply and drought. And these things uh, are being worked through now, but we need to uh, do even more with that. And I think particularly uh, in coordination with the government of Mexico as well as the, uh, the states and the tribes. Um, we encourage uh, continuation of the transboundary aquifer assessment program and funding it so it can be completed so we really understand what shared resources are under the ground. Uh, we think we've got good movement, we just need uh, a final push on that. And finally, we also need better binational management of uh, watersheds uh, that cross the border. And uh, not only the border with Mexico, but a uh, border with the tribes along the border because there are sovereignty issues and very distinct issues there as well. It's simply a matter of managing a resource in an efficient way. Uh, in terms of solid and hazardous waste, uh, the board looked at a number of issues. Uh, the problem of uh, hazardous materials movement through ports of entry has continued to plague uh, border communities for decades, and we need continued efforts. Uh, we uh, badly need a binational hazmat tracking system so we can understand where hazardous materials are in the border and uh, uh, when they move, and so on and so forth. And this will be a tremendous assistance to emergency responders who have to uh, deal with negative effects of hazardous materials. Also, uh, we suggest that the U.S. and Mexico need to continue with their discussions and move forward with coordination of the flow and management of used materials that move across the border in very large uh, quantities. The most uh, Obvious example are used tires, which flow from the U.S. and accumulate at a rapid rate on the Mexican side when they're worn out. But also we have inefficient electrical appliances, uh, used motor vehicles. It's really a binational issue that needs to be addressed binationally. Finally, we suggest the two governments need to uh, think a little bit about uh, binational recycling market development. We think there's some good business opportunities there. In terms of emergency uh, preparedness, uh, we still have problems with um, bottlenecks at ports of entry and moving emergency responders and equipment back and forth across the border. Uh, if emergencies occur in the border region, responders need to be able to move fluidly to and from those events. And uh, so we call for improve, improvement and uh, implementation of the international emergency response agreement that the U.S. and Mexico first signed in 1980 and also enhancement of the city-to-city -city agreements for, and really develop an effective emergency response system that uh, serves the border region and uh, so that uh, Tijuana doesn't have to help San Diego with an emergency by first going through Mexico City, Washington, D.C., and then finally getting back to uh, uh, Tijuana. So 
the border region is different and we need different solutions. Um, in terms of habitat and biodiversity conservation, uh, we call for better coordination of, uh, among officials uh, from both countries at all levels for management of these shared uh, biodiversity uh, resources. Um, and also implicit in this is the need for coordinated binational response to climate change, which will affect distribution and range of ecosystems and uh, uh, various species. Uh, also, um, we continue to be much interested in the mitigation of the fence impacts and long-term monitoring of the border fence, which in fact is a very large infrastructure uh, project. And, uh, and finally, uh, we call for uh, more, more direct participation of Department of Interior in the Border 2012 process so that they're really at the table with, with EPA and other agencies as well and that'll be a better match with the structure on the Mexican side of the border. In terms of, trans of institutional mechanisms, um, we again call for uh, finishing the work on creating a transboundary environmental impact assessment a project that started and stopped uh, quite a few times in the last 15 years, but we're dealing with binational environmental issues. We need to be able to clearly evaluate when projects on one side of the border will have effects on the other, and we think we can save a lot of uh, problems and improve the environment if we develop that necessary coordination. We also uh, call for clarifying the roles of border institutions to address and prioritize unmet needs. In other words, a little bit better organization and coordination of the institutions we have now. Uh, the board also uh, calls for uh, further efforts to make Border 2012 more accessible to tribes and small communities. Uh, small communities and tribes uh, sometimes have difficulty interfacing easily with uh, border 2012 and some assistance there would be helpful. Finally, um, uh, we uh, suggest that other federal agencies in addition to Interior should be participants in the Border 2012 process. For example, Departments of Energy, Agriculture, uh, DHS, uh, which is on the board, but we need them formally front and center all the time, uh, uh, Defense and, and other federal agencies. Uh, so we think there's a real opportunity as Border 2012 reinvents itself uh, to make sure that we have broader coverage on the U.S. side, and I'm sure our Mexican colleagues are rethinking how they will approach it as well. Now, a couple of the themes that cross-cut the entire report I think are worth uh, underlining. Uh, first of all, we note again and again that because of the location along the international boundary, uh, border communities face greater challenges and have a lower environmental quality than comparable communities within the United States. In other words, sitting right next to a region that is not regulated in the same way, does not have the same level of uh, infrastructure development, causes effects in U.S. communities that uh, uh, are unique to the border region. And we hope that this uh, uh, could be more widely recognized by the policy community. Uh, another point we came back to again and again is that the border region is different because there is a coincidence of poverty, ethnicity, and environmental problems in border communities. Uh, if you look at all of the counties along the U.S. side of the border, population is 68.5 percent Hispanic. If you discount uh, San Diego and Pima counties, the border population is 88% Hispanic. And um, the data on um, infrastructure deficits are quite clear as well. The border is underserved in terms of the necessary infrastructure for uh, border environmental quality, despite significant uh, efforts over the past decade and a half. Um, we call for improved coordination across the border uh, to develop binational solutions for uh, binational environmental problems. Uh, again and again, we return to the theme of we can't deal with 
border environmental problems by only dealing with half of the region that's affected by that. So this is a job for the two uh, federal governments. Uh, we need better coordination among all U.S. federal agencies with program in the border region, and we feel this would improve significantly the efficiency uh, and the ability to prioritize uh, border environmental problem resolution. In other words, uh, uh, better reorganization of the federal government uh, for the purposes of improving the situation in the border region. Well, that's my quick summary. Uh, for more information, you can contact me or, or Dolores Wesson, the DFO, and of course, we'll have a little time today to, uh, to discuss these, uh, uh, these uh, ideas. And uh, what I'd like to do uh, now is uh, turn, turn the mic over to uh, two of our, our guests, and hopefully soon a third guest, to, uh, to provide some comments uh, from their perspectives at the federal level about the work of the uh, board. Uh, our first uh, uh, commentator today is Michelle Depas, who's the head of the Office of International and Tribal Affairs at, e at EPA and very much involved in the border uh, and its environmental issues, particularly through uh, Border 2012. Michelle? Thank you very much, Paul. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. I work in the Reagan Building, so I didn't have a long trip. So this is great for me. I, we all have demanding t uh, schedules, and it's important to actually recognize the volunteers on the, the GNEB board and specifically to thank Paul Ganster for all your work and leadership in particularly in producing this report. So thank you, Paul. So we're glad that we're working closely with all of you here. Uh, this is EPA's only federal presidential advisory committee. And as it advises us and the federal government and Congress on how we can most effectively work together, it's important that we're working towards protecting communities and the environment along the U.S.-Mexico border. Specifically on behalf of the U.S. EPA Administrator, Lisa P. Jackson, I want to thank you for the recommendations in this report. Collectively, the Good Neighbor Environmental Board represented the combined voice of government, including six federal agencies, the private sector, academia, nonprofits, and tribal communities. This board represents the best and the brightest when it comes to developing how-to formulas for solving the most challenging environmental problems in our four states that neighbor Mexico. With your help, the administration has a better understanding of what people and communities along the border must put up with to keep their air, water, and land clean and their children healthy. You remind us that no individual person, no single initiative, no one agency can achieve success by itself. While the U.S. border, U.S.-Mexico border zone is a center for international commerce, communities on the border often face disproportionate environmental and health risks. That is unacceptable for EPA and it's un unacceptable for the communities we serve. To this day, Communities are burdened with massive cleanup efforts. Some border communities still don't have access to clean drinking water. That is why we need a federal advisory committee for the region and why the U.S. government and Congress have continued to develop programs that direct energy and resources to the U.S.-Mexico border. We want to continue working with all stakeholders to address legacy problems, cleanup challenges, and other future difficulties. While the Rio Grande flows along our border, the legacy problems of delivering water and sanitation to the communities remain. <coughs> Through the Environment Infrastructure Fund and Project Development Assistance Program, a total of 167 projects have been certified, 81 in the U.S. and 86 in Mexico. Over $1 billion has been committed by the North American Development Bank to support 132 of these projects in the U.S.-Mexico border region. These projects benefit some 12 million residents through improved infrastructure and a cleaner environment. For the last 10 years, 
the abandoned secondary lead smelter in Tijuana, Mexico, known as the Metales y Derivados site, posed a significant environmental and public health threat to some 10,000 people a quarter mile from the site. Through binational and community collaboration, EPA has partnered to remove more than 2,500 tons of hazardous waste from this site. By leveraging resources and working together, the Border 2012 program has now completed the, rem the remedy of the site in Mexico. This cleanup is among the first to be completed under Mexico's new cleanup law. Now the area is capped and is being used regularly as a recreational area by families and all community members. The state of Baja is also planning to open a laboratory to further environmental analysis in the area and prevent future harm. That's a real success for the people that we serve. We couldn't have achieved any of this without working with our partners here at home and across the border. In an effort to address our shared problems, EPA is collaborating with the Mexican government to ensure the availability of clean transportation fuels and the adoption of clean engine standards for the border region and throughout Mexico. With the increasing cross-border transportation, the availability of clean fuels in the U.S. and Mexico is critical for the well-being of the area's inhabitants. Cleaner fuels with its lower sulfur content significantly reduce particulate emissions, a major cause of respiratory diseases. EPA is also working to reduce the current and future threats to human health and the environment caused by growing piles of scrap tire, which Paul mentioned. Tire piles in the region have been proven to increase the incidence of waterborne illnesses. These tires are often burned, releasing dangerous toxins into the air. To reduce the risk of the used tire piles, we created a market for what was once waste, recycling tires into materials for paving roads and fuel for cement kilns. So far, the U.S. has helped remove more than four million tires from the border region, and we're continuing to work with Mexico to prevent the accumulation of scrap tire piles in the future by establishing a U.S.-Mexico border scrap tire management strategy. The challenges facing the U.S.-Mexico border region are complex and very varied. But with the recommendations that this report contains, we know that with both the Good Neighbor Environmental Board and the Border 2012 program, there we will continue to have models of cooperation and collaboration. So it's only fitting that we continue to work together to produce these great results. We recognize that to help communities, we need to build roads into the communities. To build effective schools and educate children, we need to clean up the air pollution that causes asthma and other respiratory illnesses. To clean up the air, we need to clean up the fuel that keeps the schools and homes running. These are all the things we know. And I want to thank you for submitting more than 60 recommendations on collaborative improvements to various U.S. federal agencies. I challenge you, Good Neighbor Environmental Board, to continue to develop <laughs> comprehensive and collaborative solutions to solve the largest environmental challenges facing vulnerable communities on the U.S.-Mexico border. As our shared environmental needs and challenges grow, while budget constraints are also happening, we are faced simultaneously on all levels of government on how to solve this problem. Your findings and recommendations will help us as we continue to look for innovative and robust solutions. Once again, personally, I want to thank you, and on the behalf of the US EPA, thank you for your commitment to your work, thank you for your commitment to us, and in protecting human health and environment. Muchas gracias. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to call on Nancy Sutley, who's the chair of the uh, White House Council on Environmental Quality, a former board member, uh, and uh, uh, one of the people in Washington that really understands the border, and we're absolutely delighted to have her in, in the position that she's in, and hopefully uh, uh, she can keep the border front and center uh, in various deliberations. Uh, before she talks, I'd like to just uh, formally, on behalf of the board, uh, uh, transmit a copy of our report to Nancy. 
Um, Can't go off the box. We've done, we've done our job. <laughs> uh, great. A, a, great. a little, uh, a little uh, a reading for you, but uh, uh, I'm sure that someone on your staff will enjoy it. But, uh, <laughs> so we eagerly await your remarks, Nancy. Thank you. Th thank you, Paul. And it's, uh, it's great to be here and great to see all of you, see some old friends. Um, and uh, the, uh, well, they'll let anybody in here, won't they? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it's really a pleasure to be here uh, with all of you and with the Good Neighbor Environmental Board. And as Paul said, I was a member of the board, I think, for about four years. Um, and I think fondly back on being the last person uh, out of the Yuma Airport one night as they're locking the door behind me uh, on my way to a GNAP meeting. Um, I almost ended up having to walk across Yuma that night. But anyway. Um, but I, it, I, it really is a pleasure to be here and to acknowledge uh, the, this uh, great work that the Good Neighbor Board has done um, and its continuing commitment to address uh, and highlight the environmental challenges in the U.S.-Mexico border region, which as we all know is, is home to millions of people on both sides of the border, a very uh, varied uh, and diverse landscape uh, from uh, uh, from California to Texas and on the Mexican side of the border too. So these, the work that you do and the time that you all spend as, as volunteers uh, is very much appreciated uh, by the Obama administration. We and appreciate uh, your continuing efforts. And I know how much uh, work and thought goes into these recommendations. Um, and uh, I have read a number of these reports before. Wait, I helped write a number of these <laughs> reports before, uh, but I always know they're chock full of very good uh, analysis and sound thought uh, and important uh, voice representing uh, the border and a, and a great service to us as we uh, think about the environmental priorities in, in the border region. And, and it is one that is a priority for, for uh, not only for EPA, but for the Council on Environmental Quality, a lot of uh, important things uh, that are happening along the border uh, that affect a number of federal agencies uh, and certainly um, most importantly affect the communities along the border. Um, these recommendations that come from the Good Neighbor Environmental Board I think have, have a s very special weight because they come from members of the community and they come after a very c careful deliberation uh, by the members of the board and it's important this voice um, has a lot of value in putting together a blueprint uh, for collaboration between federal agencies, between uh, with state and local government and the communities across the border region. I know as Michelle was referring to, we know the border region holds a number of, uh, a large number of uh, poor and minority communities that are disproportionately affected by the negative environmental conditions and lack of ba basic infrastructure in the area and the role of the independent advice from this group of stakeholders and others and the, the federal agencies that serve as part of the board is essential for the administration as a whole gaining an understanding of the special circumstances along the border and helping us to make informed decisions uh, which would and actions that would benefit uh, border communities and I think one of the really important roles that Gina plays is to remind all of us here in Washington, um, while I'm far away from uh, my home in California, that the border really matters uh, and it matters to us as a country, uh, it matters to the communities who live in it. Uh, I, I'm very uh, pleased to see that this report underscores the opportunities uh, to collaborate with our neighbors in Mexico to s solve environmental challenges and addressing the specific challenges that the border region will face as a result of climate change. And I think there are some good opportunities, some uh, existing efforts and some developing policies uh, between the U.S. and Mexico uh, that will affect uh, how we deal with climate change. Climate change adaptation is an area of particular interest uh, in the region and particular interest to all of us. Uh, we know that the communities in the southwest have to prepare uh, to cope with changes in water availability, with increased drought, changes in vegetation and habitat, and these are some of the impacts that you've outlined in the report. Um, 
at CEQ, along with a number of other federal agencies, is in the process right now of developing a report to the President uh, looking at recommendations for the federal government for a national climate change adaptation strategies and what more federal agencies should be doing to uh, advance our adaptation goals. So these recommendations in your report will help uh, inform those recommendations. And I know you've looked at a number of other areas which are very important, uh, including uh, better air quality monitoring, better water data, and, and improvements uh, in waste management. And that there is uh, uh, both an opportunity and a need to, to seize on some of the economic opportunities uh, pre presented by a clean energy economy that would assist uh, the border region. And the President has uh, called time and time again, uh, including earlier this week, for a comprehensive plan that transitions the United States to a 21st century clean energy economy that will protect and advance our economic interests, our national security, and our environment. And with the potential in the border region for uh, solar, wind, and other forms of clean energy, the border region is well positioned to be part of this clean energy re revolution. So uh, just in wrapping up again, really to thank the board uh, and congratulate you on a very uh, thoughtful uh, and uh, comprehensive report. Um, we will uh, look at it in detail and uh, we look forward to continuing to work with the board uh, to ensure a healthy and prosper prosperous future for the border region and for the country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Nancy. Our next uh, speaker um, is the only Mexican in Washington who's not glued to a TV set. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and we very much appreciate that Enrique Escorza, the head of the political and border affairs section of the Embassy of Mexico, is with us to uh, provide some remarks relevant to the work of the board and our report. Enrique. Thank you very much, Paul, and it's a great honor to share this table with uh, Nancy Sotley and our dear friend Michelle Depa and, and Dolores Wesson. Thank you very much for the invitation. Allow me to start first by expressing the um, gratitude of the Embassy of Mexico, in particular the gratitude of Ambassador Sarukan for this opportunity to be here today. Um, this is not for us a mere presentation of a report. We know that this report has been produced for a number of years, and we have been delighted reading them. But for us, it's very important to be here in this table in the moment that this report is being presented to the, the individuals who are supposed to be oriented, and it was envisioned and drafted, which is the President of the United States and the Congress. We value that tremendously because we believe that uh, the opportunities that we have as countries to work together on topics that are related very, very intimate, in a very intimate fashion to both countries, it's something extremely strategic for us. On the occasion of the recent state visit, you remember uh, President Calderon and President Obama reaffirmed that both countries, we are not only good friends, we are also strategic allies. And as neighbor we are, uh, we are clear that we share some aspirations and we also have identified some common goals. We want to take advantage of the so many things that uh, move us closer together as countries, as societies as well. And we are fully committed to significantly improve the lives of our citizens and communities. We know that there is only one way to address these common challenges, and that is working closely together. We have to be together and we have to act together to face those challenges such as competitiveness and to overcome some implications and consequences of climate change, global warming, and some other environmental issues as well. Today on the occasion of the presentation of this new report, we are aware that the purpose of the board, again, is to advise the President of the United States and Congress on the need for implementation of environmental and infrastructure projects within the United States to improve the quality of life of persons residing in the U.S. side of the border. But certainly that is not to say that the methodology, issues addressed, and some conclusions reached in this and other reports presented in the past are not known in Mexico, reviewed in Mexico, and extensively discussed among government officials, academics, 
and public in general. They are certainly, uh, these reports are certainly a reference point on how our neighbor, our good neighbor, sees and understands environmental agenda and share some values that we also share in terms of protecting the life of our communities. I have to tell you that I personally have benefited myself from so many reports that were presented in the past. I cannot forget that during those very complex years of the severe drought that struck the Rio Bravo, Rio Grande uh, Basin, I was director of border affairs. I just interact a lot with my good friend, Dennis Linsky, who is present here in this table. And he will not allow me to lie in this particular topic. <laughs> how dramatic, how critical those moments were in terms of confronting this severe drought that the Rio Grande Rio Basin was experiencing. And I have to tell you candidly that um, I had access to the 2001 edition of the uh, Good Neighbor Environmental Board report, I guess that was the fourth report. And uh, that document certainly confronted me with so many very powerful statements. For instance, I wanna quote one of those. Only a watershed approach can generate information that decision makers need to make sound decisions about the future of water supplies for their communities. You have no idea how insistent I was after reading this to some of my colleagues back in Mexico that we have to quit on this idea that, okay, it's our right, it's our water, it's our river. You know, that our thing is a thing of the past because the more we grow as countries, the more we interact together, the more we value that the border basically draws us together and that there are so many topics in the agenda that basically create the obligation for both governments to see things in a different way. And believe me, uh, these sort of things, um, statements and reports essentially were very powerful tools for me. They assist me great, greatly in my, in, my, in my job, in my continued job. Uh, another example, for instance, having Mexico a more centralized approach to water management, reading the eighth report was very enlightening to me because that document was incredibly generous in describing the so many federal departments, agencies, state governments, special regional districts, interstate compacts and agreements, county governments, tribes, NGOs, etc. just to name a few, on the so many people that we needed to interact and to understand if we wanted really to address the situation and to understand why the U.S. position was in a certain manner when we were in a negotiating table. It was not easy. We will have the, it was a process from government to government. And much to our surprise, that was not the case. And certainly these type of reports are very valuable in that, in that merit. Again, the Mexican government is not the recipient of these or previous reports. But as sound and well-crafted documents that they are, they have a powerful effect in firing up the debate, in boosting consultations, and moving different parties and interests closer. The value and importance of this report, at least from my per perspective, is completely out of question. Therefore, I really would like to, to join you know, this uh, tremendous good work that uh, the Good Neighbor Environmental Board is doing. I have to tell you that we will carefully review also this report, that this report is gonna be sent immediately back to Mexico City for the proper authorities to start working with it, because we believe that this report presents some very valuable topics that we need to work together again. And thank you for the opportunity that you gave us in being here, in being close to this process, and rest assured that the government of President Calderon is absolutely committed in the idea of working in this and some other topics with a common vision, a shared vision, because the border is, is one. There are two countries, but there's just one border. So we have to work together in this, and, and I'm looking forward for good results coming out from this report. Thank you very much. Uh, we now have time for some questions. Uh, and uh, Dolores uh, Wesson will moderate that session. Okay, uh, if you would identify yourself, please, uh, when posing your question, that would be very helpful. Um, 
Dinah? Uh, I'm Dinah Bear. I'm an attorney in Washington, D.C. Um, very much appreciate the report, and I appreciate the emphasis uh, running throughout the report on both binational coordination and coordination between federal agencies on our side of the border, which is often at least as much of a challenge, if not more. Um, and I also appreciate the recommendations involving mitigation and monitoring of the impacts of the border wall infrastructure. Um, as is noted, there is a lack of understanding currently on the part of the public about uh, that process, both related to the monitoring protocol that we uh, had heard would be um, announced or um, uh, shared with the public at least in its first iteration in March of this year and has not been seen yet, and the $90 million that Congress appropriated to the Department of Homeland Security for mitigation for border wall impacts in the last two fiscal years. Very, very little of that money has been spent. We understand there's some sort of holdup, um, and I was wondering if any of the panel members could comment either on the problems or even more importantly the solutions to getting um, mitigation and monitoring off the ground, uh, or more accurately, on the ground. <laughs> um, so. um, I'm not sure that uh, question would be appropriate for this panel, uh, although, uh, of course, if somebody would love or would like to answer that, they're very welcome to. But there are people in the room for the Department of Interior that I think would be more appropriately uh, um, you know, the, the, the people that you would want to ask that question uh, to. I don't know if, if, you, uh, if there's anybody in the room that would like to take the question. I might just say one thing, and I'll just, um, uh, Dinah uh, is modest in identifying herself. It was <laughs> the general counsel at CEQ for many years, so it's always a pleasure to see you, Dinah. And I think, uh, I think there are people who can answer more specifically, but I think the point um, that I would just like to make is that these, these are incredibly important issues that the federal government needs to take very seriously. We have an obligation uh, to both the people who live in the border region as well as the nation as a whole to make sure that we're doing uh, w the very important work of maintaining security along the border in a way that respects all of our values. and. Um, we are committed to doing that, and I'm hap happy to talk to you more about that. Yeah, Rick Picardi, EPA. Um, there was a recommendation on better tracking of used materials going across the border, um, including appliances and vehicles. And I was just wondering what the issues were with uh, appliances and, and vehicles. I certainly understand the problems with tires. Um, is our appliances going for disposal? Um, I guess I'm just not aware of that issue. I don't, I don't know if there's anybody here that can well, answer that question. I, um, actually, I can, if it's OK, I'll address that briefly. Um, uh, in U.S. border communities, old refrigerators, for example, uh, were discarded and then taken across and refurbished uh, to be used and sold in Mexico. But uh, there's a problem with CFCs uh, in the refrigeration systems. And then also, uh, although uh, Mexican consumers are getting relatively low-cost used goods, they're extremely inefficient. Uh, energy-wise and, and over the long term are not very cost-effective. Uh, the same with automobiles. Uh, uh, vehicles are, are exported across the border uh, to Mexico. They circulate in Mexican cities. Uh, they produce much higher level of, uh, of uh, contaminants than uh, the U.S. fleet does, or modern Mexican vehicles, and it's something that Mexican authorities have recognized as a, as a problem, how to deal with the, the old vehicles. And in a way, it, it helps U.S. communities because they export the disposal problems of old appliances and old vehicles uh, and uh, pass that uh, to Mexico. But there are economic uh, uh, values in this trade, and so the whole problem needs to be looked at and resolved, uh, really, I think, on a binational level. 
Thank you. We have time for about one more question. Hi, uh, I'm Dennis Linsky. I'm with uh, Transboundary Solutions, and I used to be a former member of the Good Neighbor Environmental Board, uh, and also Enrique's negotiating counterpart on water issues on Rio Grande. <laughs> Uh, I noticed you mentioned in the report the Transboundary uh, Environmental Impact Assessment Initiative being resurrected again. And I remember my days in government that this was always a rather delicate issue. And my days in government used to be viewed as a trilateral issue involving not just the United States and Mexico, the United States, Mexico, and Canada. But I noticed the way it's being cast in your report, it's being pretty much cast now in a bilateral U.S.-Mexico context, and I'm wondering how has the thinking evolved on this? And exactly what is the intent that you seek? It's your report, it's your intent. <laughs> 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 you want to um, no, I think he was asking what is the intent that you seek. Um, well, let me give you the short answer from the board. Uh, we're aware of the trilateral initiative, but we're just damn impatient. And this is something we needed yesterday. And uh, we're tired of the U.S. government and the Mexican governments not doing the job to uh, conclude an appropriate uh, transboundary environmental uh, impact assessment process. And. Uh, you can talk to my colleague Steve Niemeyer a little bit later on. He's got a pretty good understanding of this issue from the state level as well. Okay, well, I would uh, ask you to join us in thanking our panelists, and um, we'll have a few minutes uh, uh, to switch out the name tags, and uh, you are all very welcome to stay with us, uh, but uh, some of our guests uh, have to uh, move to other uh, engagements. Uh, so thank you very much for being here with us today.
So you uh, 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 need one more? Uh, I think we need one more. I was sure that France would show up today. I, uh, I thought they would show up right after Mexico was scoring. Yeah, we just need one more. Yeah, we just need one I got it. Gotcha. Thank you. I'm a nice boy. I'm a good boy. I never misbehave. We've heard all about it. One of the appendices of the report. <laughs> I may need it again, but uh, ah, it's fine. Oh, bless. John, and we got rid of the PowerPoint projector, so you can adjust. Well, Dean, what the heck are you doing here? I just wanted to say that Mafia wanted us to come in and support the press release, so I said, let me come down here. <coughs> <coughs> Uh, I have like 15 minutes, so I was like, I'm not going to Can we have to? Oh, I can always borrow. I need fog. Okay, you I'm more than five, too. I thought we had 15. The first time we're going to talk particularly Ladies and gentlemen, damas y caballeros, we are waiting for one more panelist to arrive. But while we do, you wouldn't mind uh, taking your seats? We can get uh, the ball rolling on the second half of this uh, this event. Of course, it seems to be board members who are talking in the uh, in the corners, but that's okay. That's my crutch. You need this ball. Yeah, just hand me all that stuff. There we go. There we go. Thank you. My name is Duncan Wood. I am a professor at the uh, Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México in uh, Mexico City. Uh, I'm also uh, affiliated with uh, CSAS here in Washington, and uh, I work on energy issues, in particular renewable energy, with the Mexico Institute here at the, uh, the Wilson Center. Um, this is a terrific event to be part of. I'm very grateful um, uh, to have been invited to moderate the second uh, part of the event today, uh, which should be a stimulating uh, roundtable discussion. Um, we will be limiting each of the speakers to a short intervention to give their own personal views, and then hopefully we'll open things up for a more dynamic discussion. Um, and uh, given that we have people from different parts of the, uh, the border region, hopefully there will be some clashing opinions here because consensus and harmony is always a bit dull, isn't it? Um, one of the things that, uh, that I enjoyed about the, uh, uh, the report 
is that in addition to identifying the huge challenges that exist for environmental management on the border, thank you very much, um, it also points out, not just through the recommendations, but points out more implicitly the huge opportunities that exist. And uh, I've been working in the area of renewable energy now for a little while, and the link between renewable energy and economic and social development uh, is a link that, uh, that interests me deeply, in particular up near the border, um, and in particular, of course, on the Mexican side. Um, another issue that comes through explicitly and implicitly um, in the report is the need for coordination. Now, the emphasis here today has been predominantly on coordination between different government agencies, but of course there's need for cooperation between the different intergovernmental agencies that already exist up near the border um, to do with environmental management, to do with uh, climate change issues, etc. Um, another thing which I think is, uh, is fundamentally important about the, uh, the report and which came through very, very clearly in the presentations today is the fact that the border is a unique area. Um, it's unique, obviously, in, cultural, in a cultural sense. It's unique socially and it's unique in terms of the environmental challenges which face it. And I think that uh, Enrique's comment earlier on about the need to look at water issues on the border region in terms of watersheds, a uh, recommendation from a previous report, uh, highlights how the environment itself does not necessarily understand or respect the idea of the border. Um, and there are some stunning photographs in the report which show clearly how animals come to the border and stand there saying, what the heck is this? This wasn't here yesterday. Um, the false dichotomies that I think have been put forward in, uh, in, uh, in, in over the years with regards to environment versus the economy, environment versus efficiency, environment versus security, are in essence false dichotomies. And I think that's one of the interesting dimensions that we should have a chance to draw out here today uh, in this uh, roundtable discussion. Because clearly, as I mentioned earlier on, the link between uh, environmental initiatives and the creation and generation of employment um, is an opportunity, in particular for border regions. Um, the opportunities for renewable energy on the border, in particular on the Mexican side of the border, to generate wealth to generate uh, employment and to generate innovation and technological advances in Mexico with the idea of exporting renewable energy perhaps to states in the United States who need to meet, meet their renewable energy portfolio standards. Um, one thing that I think that uh, looking ahead to maybe the next edition of this report, which I hope to have a discussion on later on, is the idea of the 21st century border and the idea uh, that the Mexican and U.S. federal governments are going to be working harder over the coming years to try to update, to modernize the border. And this report seems to me a very, very good way of beginning to think about who are or who is the broader community of stakeholders that should be involved in the discussions over that. I'm thinking, of course, about the, uh, the, uh, the areas of energy, um, of employment, and in particular, one concept of, re of resilient communities, which has come up recently when talking about security at the border. Um, Resilient communities are communities which are very, very well placed, which have strong foundations, which have economic opportunities, which have support networks. And of course, that will be intimately tied to environmental management. With that, um, I would like to, uh, to turn over to the, uh, the members of the board who are sitting to my right here. Um, we'll go, as it uh, is said on the, uh, the agenda here, beginning with uh, Russell Frisbee uh, from the Washington Liaison Office. Um, uh, the Department of State Office of uh, Mexican Affairs. I'm not going to do full introductions because I think that just wastes too much time and you have their biographies in front of you in the sheets of paper. So, Russell, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Duncan. It's a real pleasure to be here today and I did want to start out by commending the work that the, <coughs> that the board has done. It's an obviously it's a tremendous effort as we had the presentation earlier. Uh, all done in a voluntary spirit as well, which I think is really quite impressive. So. Dr. Paul Ganter and Dolores Wesson as the uh, spearheaders of this, this effort. Uh, the, em the entity, the agency that I represent really wanted me to pass on our thanks and gratitude for it. And I do want to make one thing clear here because I think there is perhaps a misrepresentation in uh, I am not with the Department of State. I happen to physically work there, which was a great opportunity for me, but my organization is the International Boundary and Water Commission U.S. section, which is based in El Paso, Texas, and they've always had a position in Washington, D.C., and uh, I happen to be lucky enough to have taken that position up uh, less than six weeks ago, actually, so I'm a, a relative newbie on, on the beat, 
But because I was with the Foreign Service and I wasn't a State Department officer before, um, there's perhaps some confusion among some of the people I work with as to who were, were, which hat, which sombrero I happen to be wearing today. But I am representing the IBWC. And I, I'm grateful for the opportunity and the invitation to give a personal view that Duncan Wood made because I think that gives me a perfect opportunity not to rehash some of the points that have been made regarding the points of emphasis in the report, but, but actually express as an individual who was until six weeks ago uh, a member of the private sector, uh, three years out of government, and during which time I certainly did develop a real appreciation for the importance of entities like the Good Neighbor Environmental Board and the kind of impact they have on the formulation and execution of policy by government. The United States, I think, is quite unique in having the system advisory committees of, of advisory committees that exist here replicated in some countries in the world, and we certainly, uh, as a matter of policy, try to encourage it. But it, it really does inform and enrich the development of policy in, in a way that is uh, not always available and present in other parts of the world. And it is quite obvious, given the breadth of this report and the number of issues covered, uh, that you've taken your work very, very seriously and uh, have really done a comprehensive job. Now, other mention has been made of the importance of coordination, and I'm happy to report that the organization that I'm representing here today, the International Boundary and Water Commission, depending on how you look at it, can trace its roots as a binational commission back virtually to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo after the U.S.-Mexican War, and certainly has existed in the form that it is today uh, since uh, before the end of the Second World War. That is to say, it is an international commission that comprises two sections, one in the U.S. based in El Paso and the other in Ciudad Juarez, which is the Mexican section headquarters. And so for uh, many, many decades, I think that the work of the commission, uh, very technical work regarding the maintenance of boundary water treaties and execution thereof uh, is an example, really par excellence, of the kind of coordination and cooperation that is, that is vital for treating the kinds of issues that have been raised in the report. I'm not su suggesting that we replicate the IBWC in, in going forward, but I think that uh, we can really point to a very, very uh, proud record and uh, of accomplishment over the years that uh, has served both countries really very, very well. And in my few short weeks with the, with the Commission, it is quite clear to me the extent to which coordination is really the watchword. I can assure you that this week I have spent <laughs> as many hours in conference calls as I did in my previous entire diplomatic career. This is something that the, that the Commission takes very seriously, working with U.S. governmental entities, so the Department of Interior, Bureau of Reclamation, with the states, with uh, other agencies of government, Department of Homeland Security, the Environmental Protection Agency, and so forth. This is also the case with Mexico. Uh, in my short time with the agency as well, we have uh, had uh, several meetings that I have been particip participated in with Mexican counterparts, and we really do achieve uh, and, and enrich our policy options and discussion through this type of coordination. And so it does, uh, it sits very well with the kind of recommendations that, uh, that are sort of cross-cutting, as Dr. Ganster mentioned, uh, in, in, as we go forward with the execution of some of the recommendations that are in the report. So with that, I think I would, that's my personal view of things, and there are, of course, some issues that relate to washer in, water in the recommendations, which are, uh, of course, po uh, in the report, and if, if there are questions on that, we can get to those later, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Russell. Um, moving quickly on, and I, I hope we have you correctly down here, Steve. Um, Steve Niemeyer, Man of, Manager for Water Affairs, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. Yes, thank you, Duncan. I uh, appreciate it very much. Uh, a couple of things, uh, you know, when you said we're gonna limit time here, I thought, I hope he's not referring to me. Because uh, uh, <laughs> most of you, some of you who know me know I'm a man of few words, but. <laughs> In any case, I'm just Carl and Sam, if you're watching, Daddy says hello. So <laughs> I just wanted to, first of all, a couple of things, and I don't know if we've done this yet, but can we take time to do this? We've got a couple of board members who I don't know if we recognized. Uh, my good friend and colleague, Gary Gillen, back there from Texas, 
and uh, Patty Krebs is here also. Can we? Is that okay? Can we do that? So I just want to say hello. Uh, we're not the we're we're the board members here who are speaking, but they're here as well. So I just wanted to mention that. A uh, couple of things, and then I also wanted to give a shout out to Dolores Wesson, our DFO, because she did a tremendous job on this report, and uh, she came in sort of as a newbie back in September, and has finished this report as well as a very exhausting letter, as Bill Bresnick can testify, uh, <laughs> about the border fence. So, in, in, in a in a real short time period, so uh, she was tremendous to work with. So I wanted to just yeah, mention that. Um, in any case, it's a pleasure for me to be here today at the Woodrow Wilson Center representing the state of Texas on the Good Neighbor Environmental Board for the rollout of our 13th annual report. I've had the good fortune to work on every GNEV report since the fourth report uh, issued in 2001 in which Enrique Escorza referenced earlier. When Nancy Sutley was on the board, she was on the board for that. And um, from, from uh, the list of issues, you can go back and look at the previous reports. This is the most comprehensive report the board has uh, ever issued. I'm going to highlight, I could highlight a lot of things, but I'm going to focus on just a few. Uh, for this report, I led the development of the water chapter, and I'm going to highlight these things from a state perspective. And Sally Spiner of the IBWC also did a tremendous amount of work on this report, on that chapter. And um, Doug Frisbee uh, covered some of the topics, and some of the topics were also covered previously. And, and Doug mentioned IBWC, which has an important role along the, uh, the board. Water is a key for the border, and Enrique Scorsa mentioned that as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just a, a crucial thing. So there's a, an old New Mexico expression um, that I, John D'Antonio, the New Mexico state engineer, told me, mi casa es su casa, pero mi agua es mi agua. <laughs> <laughs> and we understand that very clearly in Texas. There's a, a new recommendation from the chapter on water, which says that um, we'd like to uh, ensure compliance with treaties. And the state of Texas would particularly like the term extraordinary drought, which is used in the 1944 water treaty, Mexico-U.S.-Mexico water treaty, but is not defined. We'd like to see that defined for the Rio Grande. And in fact, in 2007, the 10 U.S.-Mexico border, border governors developed a declaration that said we want to see this defined and we want to present this definition to the two federal governments for their consideration. So that's something that we think is important and if, I think if we do that, it would help enhance water security, which is also part of that recommendation. Uh, I'm just, I'm just going to state this, I'm not going to say anything else, but in the report we mentioned that the Border Environment Cooperation Commission identified $1.1 billion in water and wastewater needs for the 2009-2010 fiscal year, and EPA budgeted $17 million. That's all I'm going to say uh, regarding that. I'm not going to say anything else. Um, uh, it's a pity to me that due to space limitations, we had to excise a case study in the binational San Pedro River because uh, this river uh, exemplifies many of the problems associated with water on the border. It's a binational river. There are groundwater issues. Uh, the river crosses both countries. There are sanitation issues. It takes wastewater from Mexico, from Nogales, um, Sonora, and treats it in the U.S. And the Mexican federal government actually pays for that to be treated at the U.S. International Wastewater Treatment Plant. The wastewater goes, is discharged to the San Pedro River again, and then it eventually disappears into the ground, and so they're you know, surface water, groundwater <laughs> issues. So my point there is that some of these water issues, a lot of border issues are very complicated and require stakeholders at the local, state, federal level, federal levels, and NGOs, not just on one side of the border, but both sides of, of the border. And if you don't have all the parties at the table, you're not going to get a quick solution, and you may not get a solution at all. So that's something that, uh, that's a theme of the report that comes across, I think, collaboration and coordination, and uh, it's been picked up on earlier. Uh, Russ just mentioned it. You need to have that on the border. If you don't have it, it's not going to happen. From the emergency response chapter, we recommended uh, the need to also rapidly resolve issues such as liability that hinder or prevent emergency responders from one nation 
responding in the other nation in case of natural and other disasters. And uh, this, this may seem like a trivial issue, but there are, ability, there are abilities to respond in one country that where re emergency responders won't go across because of some of these issues. Uh, Hurricane Dolly and what's the other one? Uh, recently, the Mexicali earthquake have shown the need for something that can be done quickly. And, you know, and, and as uh, Paul Ganser said earlier, you know, when they're crossing the border, it's, sometimes it's not so much getting across the border, but it's coming back. These guys, you know, don't need to prove the customs and border protection. Yeah, this is our fire engine uh, that we took across. This is the, our, our SCBA. These are the kinds of things that we need to come up with some kind of quick mechanism to allow that to happen. Um, as Paul said earlier, and in fact, there were questions about this. I don't even need to really talk about it, from a, but from a state perspective, I think it's important, and, and uh, Dennis Linsky asked a question about this. Uh, the U.S. and Mexico need to work and finally conclude an agreement on transboundary environmental impact assessment. And uh, if it's done with Canada, that's great. But it was l written in the 1994, uh, that was part of the a side agreement to the NAFTA. They were supposed to have concluded the three nations in agreement by January 1st of 1997, which if my math is correct, 2020 minus 1997, oh, it's 13 years. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so 13 years and we still have, don't have an agreement. So if we can come up with this agreement, it would really help. I cannot tell you the number of transboundary environmental projects that have been affected. I've affected one country because of a project, because of, you know, some project that has affected one country because of something in the other. And we still don't have a solution to that. Uh, you know, and, and what's really tragic, if you ask me, is when my colleagues in Mexico learn about something from me that they don't, that's going on in their country that's going to affect our country that they didn't even know about. Uh, and this happens, uh, sadly, in, in this day and age still. So I think the sooner the, the U.S. and Mexico, with or without Canada, can do something about this, I think the better off we are. Thank you. You were very well disciplined. Well done. <laughs> Um, our next speaker is Alison Sewick, Executive Director for the GILA, is that correct? GILA. GILA, thank you. Resources Information Project in New Mexico. Great, thank you, Duncan. Um, as Duncan mentioned, I'm Director of the GILA Resources Information Project, which is a nonprofit environmental organization located in Silver City, New Mexico. And for those of you who don't know the area, it's located in the southwestern corner of the state. And before I begin, I would like to reiterate what, what Steve um, said, and that is a big thank you to Dolores, uh, to Mark Joyce, Anne-Marie Gantner, the EPA contractors, and all the staff that pulled this report together. Because as Steve said, it was the most comprehensive report that the board has ever done, and I know it was a huge job to get this pulled together. So um, I know we all, I can probably say on behalf of the board, we all appreciate your very hard work. So. Um, I'd like to focus my remarks today on those issues and board recommendations of particular importance to New Mexico. I was able to caucus with uh, the other New Mexico board members to develop um, some of the points that we'd like to highlight uh, today. For this report, I led the, the development of the AIR chapter, so I'm going to start out talking about, about that chapter. Um, the oz ozone, in particular matter, air quality problems affect both rural and urban communities. Um, as some of you know, the newly proposed uh, ozone standard, um, once promulgated, could bring new counties in New Mexico and elsewhere on the border into non-attainment. Um, in terms of particulate matter, we've got unpaved roads, agricultural sources, construction, open burning, brick kilns, overgrazing, all contribute to high particulate matter concentrations throughout the region. Uh, using EPA data, the board estimated that 5 million people in the border region are exposed to health-threatening levels of air pollution. It's a huge number. We believe that the long-term goal for the border region should be to develop air quality management authorities and tools needed to meet and maintain air quality standards. How are we going to do that? It's a big job. Uh, I think the board really... Uh, thought out of the box. We were uh, very creative. I think it's going to take a lot of creativity um, to 
achieve additional emission reductions. Paul mentioned earlier that we have different regulatory structures. We have different uh, resources between both sides of the border, amounts of resources. This all leads to um, sort of a, a, a difference in the uh, emission re reductions that have been achieved uh, to date. So we need to encourage new legal mechanisms for cost-effective emission reductions in binational air, air sheds, such as offsets, emissions offsets and trading. Um, the lack of, or the, the lack of resources on the Mexican side of the border, and in some cases even on the U.S. side of the border, especially in terms of rural communities, um, this is a, a really uh, critical problem in terms of getting at that low-hanging fruit, trying to achieve those cost-effective emission reductions. One of the um, big recommendations that we had was to encourage um, the BEC and NADBank U.S. board members, so Treasury, EPA, and State, to work with their Mexican counterparts to make grant funds available for binational air quality projects that have a documented environmental benefit and lack sufficient funding. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about road paving, uh, vehicle inspection and maintenance, uh, diesel engine replacement. These are some of the, the things that could really uh, achieve a big bang for the buck if we were able to get these uh, programs in place on the Mexican side. Um, water supplies, I'll shift to water now. Water supplies uh, in the New Mexico border region and all along the border are under threat by over-exploitation, long-term drought, and climate change. Given that the region's surface and groundwater resources are shared by both sides of the border, um, and in the case of the New Mexico border region, we have six transboundary uh, aquifers that are shared between the U.S. and Mexico. Uh, we need uh, cooperation and joint water resources planning and management with our Mexican counterparts. It's a necessity. We, that This is a common theme, cross-cutting theme. The board recommended that we ensure the success of the Transboundary Aquifer Assessment Program to scientifically characterize aquifers that underlie the international boundary and encourage other efforts to improve data gathering and accessibility for border water resources. So we need to first collect the data to, dis to figure out what, what in fact we're dealing with. And in New Mexico, New Mexico State University and the um, Universidad Autónoma de Ciudad Juárez. They've been working for many years on, on uh, doing uh, assessment of our surface and groundwater resources, and they continue to work together under the Transboundary Aquifer Assessment Program. As Steve also mentioned, the binational stakeholder groups are important for uh, jointly planning and managing at the watershed level. And uh, if we, we are doing this in the Columbus Palomas area, and as Steve says, if you don't have all the stakeholders at the table, um, it, you know, you're not going to be able to do it. And having the resources available for those local groups is, is very important. Um, we've talked about climate change. I'll just quickly say that we all know the border region is an arid region. Um, our water resources are already stressed, and climate change will only exacerbate that, that issue. Um, so. We, I agree with uh, Chair Sutley, and, and I'm pleased to hear that uh, the Obama administration is, is uh, talking about a national adaptation strategy. This is very important, especially in the border. We need adaptation tools and collaboration for water supply reliability, drought preparedness, and improved water conservation. Um, on the positive side, in terms of renewable energy, and Duncan mentioned this, uh, this region is a world-class renewable energy resource and represents a significant opportunity for renewable energy development in the border region. New Mexico, uh, particularly for solar, there are a number of concentrated solar projects that are under consideration, and obviously the connection to development of the green economy and economic development in the border region. This is very important. Um, so to the extent that we can enhance our collaboration with Mexico, um, on development of renewable energy resources. This is just an incredible opportunity for the entire region. Finally, uh, in terms of habitat and biodiversity conservation, this is very important to New Mexico. As many of you know, the boot heel region of the state is um, uh, very important in terms of wildlife habitat and migration corridors. 
Uh, this is a location of um, some of the last remaining uh, Chihuahuan desert grassland ecosystems as well as Sky Island ecosystems and, and these areas are, are at risk from land conversion, depletion, land conversion to agriculture, um, uh, depletion of groundwater aquifers, border security activities, Im illegal immigration, drug tra trafficking, this whole big, big picture. Um, so I uh, want to reiterate the, the uh, recommendations uh, put forth in the board's report about really looking at um, landscape scale conservation and wildlife corridor development between federal, state, and local governments on both sides of the border. That's what's going to be important. Also, uh, putting the uh, looking at the impacts of the border fence in that context, and want to reiterate uh, Paul's um, summary in terms of uh, monitoring not just in Arizona but along the entire border, monitoring the environmental impacts of the border fence. Um, and, and also the mitigation of those, those impacts. And on behalf of uh, the Good Neighbor Environmental Board New Mexico members, we just wanted to, to say that we look forward to working with our federal, state, and local partners in the U.S. and Mexico as we work collaboratively to improve the shared border environment. And thank you very much. Thank you, Alison. Um, I was particularly delighted to hear you talk about uh, university university cooperation, the development of human capital, human resources at the border, which is something which uh, I'm particularly interested in. Um, it, it, it works. It, it works in creating a public conscience. It works in creating new people who will work in that area and who can actually come up with new and innovative responses to the challenges that we face. Uh, moving along, um, Anne-Marie Wolfe, uh, president of the Sonora Environmental Research Institute from Arizona. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Thank you. I'm Anne Marie Wolf, as Duncan said, and we're based in Tucson. And Sonora Environmental Research Institute, we're a nonprofit organization that we primarily work on environmental health issues, but we also work on other issues. And I also talked with my colleagues from Texas, or excuse me, from Arizona. I'm surrounded by Texans this whole week, so I'm thinking <laughs> Texas. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I want to just briefly talk about some of the issues important to southern Arizona. And Steve and Allison have actually touched on a number of them already. So, but I'll give you some perspectives from Arizona. So first, talking about air quality and also energy. We're very concerned about uh, air quality along the border. Four of our border communities are uh, Cochise County, Santa Cruz County, Yuma, and Pima County are all non-attainment for particulate matter less than 10 microns. So we very much support the binational airshed management approach. And recently, Santa Cruz County has become non-attainment for particulate matter less than 2.5 microns. So that's something we're really concerned about. And as Allison mentioned, a lot of the dust in Arizona as well as in New Mexico is from uh, unpaved roads, but there are also agriculture sources. So those are two areas that we would need to focus on. And there are other sources as well, but those are two of the primary sources. Along with air quality, not just dust, we are concerned about hazardous air pollutants and would like to see the air quality monitoring networks expanded throughout the border, not just in Arizona, but in the other communities as well, so we can get a better handle on hazardous air pollutants along the, co along the border. Uh, as far as um, energy, Pima County, which is the t uh, county Tucson is in, but also is along the border as well, has initiated pilot projects for solar energy projects. And I think Arizona would like to be a leader as far as in renewable energy, and particularly solar energy. And these two pilot projects, which have been initiated by the county, I hope can, can take the county and the southern Arizona is a leader in the solar energy department, but we support any activities as far as renewable energy. And one of the concerns that has been brought up in Arizona is water consumption as far as the production of energy and making sure that that's all looked as we switch to renewable sources, that we look at water consumption as well, because in southern Arizona, water is a primary concern. Moving to water and wastewater, we still have a number of communities, including in the Tucson metropolitan area, that aren't hooked up to a wastewater system or have a septic system. They <coughs> basically have cesspools or just use a hole or, or something like that. Uh, and so we are concerned about uh, lack of infrastructure for wastewater and are, would support you know, additional funding, as Steve mentioned, for infrastructure projects and particularly water and wastewater so we can 
get everyone onto some type of wastewater system, some type of treatment system. We have, we still have uh, uh, fantastic, well, depending on your view, we have a lot of growth in Santa Cruz County. And the, so we need to lo really look at water use in Santa Cruz County. And again, we'd support the regional looking at water across the region, and particularly the Nogales, Arizona, and Nogales, Sonora, or Ambos Nogales, as we call it, which is they are, or Nogales, Arizona is in Santa Cruz County, but the Santa Cruz County is just r rapidly growing, so we need to look at that regional approach to water management. <laughs> We're also concerned about transboundary water flows, and particularly stormwater, and stormwater events across the border in Ambos Nogales, and we urge the, the IBWC to take a a uh, close look at that, okay, and the, and the issues that have happened in the past in Nogales regarding the stormwater events, okay. Habitat and biodiversity, one of the things I do on the side, I've worked closely uh, for uh, six, seven years, I ran a program where we monitored archaeology sites for, for vandalism in all the, uh, with the Forest Service, the, the Department of Interior, Bureau of Land Management, and uh, closely with the Coronado National Forest. And they have, they're the national forest with the most miles along the U.S. border. And working with the for national forest and the archaeologists, they're extremely concerned about the effects of infrastructure on cultural and natural resources along the U.S.-Mexico border. And it, it uh, pains me when I go to sites that were pristine and still very well preserved, and then later I come back and unfortunately because of various reasons they've now been impacted, highly impacted. Uh, we're also concerned about wildlife corridors, in particular for the jaguars and the pronghorn, and uh, we talked about that in the report. One of our main concerns about invasive species is buffalo grass in the county, Santa Cruz and Pima County have or extensive programs now, and particularly Saguaro National Park on removing buffalo grass. And it's look not, it's an invasive species, but it's also a, ha a, high, a fire hazard, and we're concerned about its effect on the complete Sonoran Desert, as far as if, um, because buffalo grass, <coughs> it just thrives in the Sonoran Desert, okay. And um, I'm also concerned about the Greater Sonoran Desert uh, Protected Ecosystem, which is uh, Oregon Pipe National Monument and the National Park in Mexico, below Oregon Pipe, the Pinacates, and um, further protection of that area as well. So those are the main Arizona. And just on the personal note, at, so at our organization, we do environmental health issues, and we're on the ground. We have a large group of volunteers, <laughs> primarily women, that walk and go door to door. They visit the communities, they visit homes, they go to community events, and the amount of health issues that we are running into and that continue to increase, especially re upper respiratory illnesses and asthma in particular, we're not seeing a decrease. We're seeing an increase in that. We're also seeing an increase in other issues that are associated with environmental health problems. <laughs> and most disturbing is that we've recently seen, and now the University of Arizona is implementing a study of aggressive breast cancer in young women along the U.S.-Mexico border. And it, the study has just begun, but this is a really a concern to us that we're seeing these impacts and people, you know, we aren't sure why they're happening or what's going on, but it, um, but that study in particular that we're seeing, what the clinic we work with are is seeing aggressive breast cancer in women 17, 18 year, years old. So we're not sure what's going on there, but the thought is that it's some environmental health impact. So I support all the recommendations in the report, especially the collaboration, and uh, with that, Finish. Thank you, Anne-Marie. <laughs> um, I now turn over the microphone to, I guess, a distant uh, relative of mine from a long time ago. Well, could Welcome be back. A long time ago. <laughs> um, John Wood, County Commissioner from uh, Cameron County, Texas. Thank you. John. Thank you. I, I am John Wood, and I do serve as a County Commissioner in Cameron County, Texas. And being the last on the panel is makes it a little difficult because yes. my my colleagues here have covered most everything. There are a couple things I'd like to reiterate, though, because. Even though you know we have several of us here that live in states that border the international border or live relatively close to the international border, I could in five minutes walk from my office or 15 minutes from my home and cross the border because we live there. We live it every day and we deal with all of these issues that have been uh, brought out today. 
I want to reiterate a little bit. Um, you know, we're talking about water, wastewater, air, emergency response. That's an important factor to all of us who live on the border, in a city on the border. We can have anything from fires that need assistance from the Mexican firefighters, the Mamaderos, in coming into the U.S., or in Mexico, where our firefighters have to go into Mexico and help control the fires there to prevent uh, loss of life and loss of property. Uh, renewable energy is becoming something in our area is becoming very important. We're getting several wind farms in our general area. We've got other companies, one from England, that uh, is looking at establishing some wind farms in the Gulf, out in the water. Uh, they hope to have that done if everything goes well in the next five years. Natural habitat is very important to us. Uh, we've talked about the, or the, it was mentioned the border fence, the border wall. Uh, the border fence has cut off a lot of natural habitat for our you know, wildlife in our area. We have one of the last stands of uh, native palms that are um, rapidly disappearing. And by building this fence through that uh, sanctuary, we're going to have less and less of those. And we're going to also actually restrict the public from being able to go out there and enjoy and look and learn and the school kids to be able to learn what this is about, what our natural habitat is about, and what it provides, the habitat it provides for the wildlife in our area. Biodiversity, border security, we all believe in border security, and we, we would like to see that border security is something that is also compatible with the way we live, and the way we live on both sides of the river. Um, the, the fence has uh, created some issues, not too much, uh, upheaval in Mexico is but under you know under their breath they talk about it and we talk about it but they the folks who are coming over and want to come over find a way you know they've got 20 foot ladders and our fence is only 18 feet high they also have cutting torches and uh, there there are gaps in the fence uh, uh, many gaps in the fence that you know unfortunately the the wildlife can't figure out which direction to go to find the gap whereas the human coming across know where to go. When they come across now, we're seeing them coming across much more aggressive than they have in the past, which is putting our Border Patrol officers and, and our folks in harm's way much more than it did in the past. So that's a problem. Health issues, uh, we see that all throughout the border. And I'd like to read from the May 19th, 2009 uh, letter that Dr. Ganster wrote. Uh, to bring some of this into focus about what the border is about. In the year 2000, border cities and counties had 12.4 million people. And by 2010, that population will, re will reach 17.1 million. And by 2020, it's expected to reach 24.1 million. If the U.S. border counties comprise the 51st state, they would rank first in federal crimes, 13th in total population, second in incidence of tuberculosis, third in hepatitis related deaths. Deaths with hepatitis is something that we see quite a bit of. In unemployment, it would be fifth. It would be 40th in per capita income and 51st in the number of healthcare professionals per capita. So the border region, again, is characterized by environmental problems unlike those in any other part of the nation. And I think with what we do at Good Neighbor Environmental Board and what EPA does and a lot of the other federal agencies do is to try to address these issues, but sometimes I feel like in addressing these issues, one entity doesn't always know what the other entity is doing or how they're handling it, or they have different requirements, or they have different specifications, or they, they just don't communicate as well as we who live on the border are required to communicate with our neighbors across the border. And we're required to do that for our only livelihood and for, our, for the sake of all of us and for the good of all of us. I find that uh, a lot of it has to do with funding and with money. IBWC is tasked with the effort of maintaining the levees, for example, along the river in Texas to keep flooding from uh, destroying uh, like it did in, in uh, New Orleans, the, where the levees, levees fell there. 
but with the amount of money they receive annually, it's a pittance, and, and they have no way to maintain those levies. Now, last year, the stimulus funds did bring in a lot of money, and IBWC has been spending that money to bring our levies up to par, to where they should be based on the treaty with Mexico. But then I also wonder, what is Mexico doing? Do they have the money, and have their levies been beat down like our levies were? To where, if we do have a flood along the river, the water's going to go the least resistance, and we're going to see a lot of flooding in, in Mexico. I know in our area, I can look across the river and see the condition of the Mexican levees and, and know that the water's not going to come in Brownsville, and it's not going to come in into Hidalgo or, or McAllen. It's going to go on the other side of the river. It's going to go south. And there are some large populated areas over there that are going to be inundated and flooded with this water. When that happens, there are a lot of people that are U.S. citizens that are going to need to get back across the river. And so we've got problems getting back across the river based on the different problems that we have with customs and immigration and the, just the plan of, of getting back in a, in a, you know, having to do with the emergency response and getting people back to where they belong and getting people from the U.S. back into Mexico. So there are a lot of problems that we live with daily, that we work with daily, and uh, we're looking to uh, put this information out so that our federal government and our state government, Mr. Niemeyer, uh, can, uh, and, uh, you know, can work together with us and with Mexico to see that uh, we are able to live in a similar situation like the rest of the nation lives. And I appreciate being here, and I appreciate y'all being here. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, we come to the point in our discussions where we're going to open up for uh, questions from the audience, comments from the audience. I'm going to be ambitious, and I'm going to say that we will collect three to begin with, um, and, uh, and then see how the panel responds. But uh, much more than just being a panel discussion, we have a wealth of talent and uh, intellect here in the, in the room. So uh, anybody who would like to contribute and participate in the debate, the floor is open. So does anybody want to lead off? Rob, thank you. Rob Donnelly. Hi, Robert Donnelly from the Woodrow Wilson Center, Mexico Institute. There's a, a lot of talk about a, uh, the need for a binational emergency uh, management arrangement. And I was curious uh, about the panel's thoughts about an MOU, a federal to federal MOU, um, that, would, that would establish the protocol um, to allow for that transfer. And um, as, as you were mentioning, um, emerg the first responders being able to go back to their home countries after um, after uh, you know, putting out fires, helping flood victims, um, any thoughts on on the likelihood of a federal to federal MOU in the in the near term? Okay, can I uh, take another question? Anybody else who would like to? I'm going to throw in one of my own, if I may, and that is on the question of uh, of municipal trash, garbage, the handling of it, and whether you've seen any progress on converting garbage into methane to, uh, to produce electricity. It's something that's going on in, uh, in Monterrey, in, in Mexico, in Nuevo León. Um, and there's a big Mexican government push right now to try to get methane to markets in that sense. And I wonder if you've seen anything else more broadly across the border. Is there another question from the, uh, from the floor? Thank you. Hi, Jeremy Fancher with uh, Senator Tim Johnson's office. <clears throat> My question is regarding in the report you talk about setting up uh, essentially a joint international bond market uh, between counties and mun municipalities on either side of the border in order to fund joint infrastructure projects. The tone of the report sort of indicates that unique research from scratch would have to be conducted in order to figure out how to set up the precedent to uh, start this international bond market. But I'm curious, is there uh, any history of this sort of um, collaboration between countries taking place anywhere else in the world? And can that be used as a model for this? Um, and also, it seems like the municipalities wouldn't initially or initiate this on their own. So at the behest of what institution or agency would this joint uh, bond issuance take place? Thank you very much. Um, let's go, uh, if we go in reverse order, John, would you like to lead off? If we're talking about the um, a federal MOU or, or an agreement with the feds, uh, uh, 
both sides of the river the u s government federal government mexican federal government to get people back and forth across those are all good and well and you know we need to have those types of things the sister city agreements that we have seem to work a little bit better maybe than the federal level because they're more one on one and they're immediate but that doesn't solve the issue of the particular person in charge at the point of entry whether or not they comply as conveniently use the word conveniently as they probably would need to steve mentioned you know this is this is my fire truck i'm bringing it back well you know what are you going to go through to bring it back and it may be the inspector on duty it may be you know the port inspector it may be a division inspector who knows who's going to be there when you get ready to come back we have been successful in the brownsville area in cameron county actually in a couple of the other bridge crossings that we've had emergency vehicles go to the other side and work do flooding do putting out fires and but a lot of that was done before the some of the more stringent security issues right now it's would be very difficult although we're being told that even though the firefighter may not have all of his passports or paperwork that he's going to be let back into the u s well most of our firefighters are of mexican national origin hispanics and you know my my daughter in law is and she gets pulled over and stopped and questioned for two or three hours at a time she her great grandfather was born in in the u s but those things you know or something we have to look at municipal garbage i know we did a field trip in what is where the landfill there first off the landfill has has a couple hundred acres of tires you know with roads down through them and between them and among them so that they can manage the the tires but they also have a facility that collects the uh... the gases from the landfill itself and they generate electricity right there on site they put it back into the grid and my understanding is that that then helps uh... the town the city of what is to offset their cost of energy from the federal government which provides electricity so some of that's happening it should be happening more and more everywhere the issuing of bonds it it would be really really difficult for most communities that i know of along the border to have the capacity the financial capacity to participate in something like that other than just you know saying we'll be glad to sign on it if it doesn't uh, tie up our financial capacity in one way or another. Emma? No, I'll pass. Okay. Um, I, d I don't have anything to add to the first two questions, but um, Paul Ganster, please help me out. We had an excellent presentation at the Border Institute number 10 in Rio Rico in March. And was it Sergio Espinosa? I forget his first name, but he uh, has done a lot of research on this idea of binational municipal bonds. And if you look in the references on page 58, um, you'll see the reference to his paper. And I believe it; those papers are or already are available on the SCRP website. Is that true, Paul? Or soon to be? So. Soon to be. So. Yeah. SCERP.org, S-C-E-R-P. But uh, he's uh, a really um, creative uh, guy, and um, he, he's done a lot of research. And, he, and so this was a very interesting idea that was presented at, the, at that um, conference back in March. So check that out. Yeah, just a couple of things. One of them is under the what do you call it, La Paz Agreement, which is the actual agreement between the U.S. and Mexico on border environmental cooperation. There are several implementation programs, and we're now in one called Border 2012. But as a result of that, a lot of the sister cities have had these emergency response plans, sister city emergency response plans. Well, they're, when it was created, it was done as part of the joint response team or I don't know, JCP, Joint Contingency Plan. So it was for environmental disasters. Well, now they're trying to make these into all hazards. 
And the issue is that we still have a number of problems getting people back and forth and how to resolve those and how can you expedite things to make it quicker. Uh, in fact, we did an entire report, I think it was the 11th report, where we discussed some of these issues. Uh, and we just, in fact, a lot of those recommendations were in the same, taken out of that report and put in here. Uh, but, you know, there are things that need to be uh, examined and looked at. And John touched on some of them. And, you know, I mean, uh, Brownsville Fire Department goes over and helps out the Mexicans uh, on, on occasion. I mean, and, uh, you know, they're, I don't know. I've got, I got my latest passport and I got one of these uh, border cards that allows you to cross uh, at land crossings and for sea crossings. And, you know, firefighters could have those that would help them get across or at least come back. I don't think they really care so much when you go over there, but when you come across. <laughs> but should the firefighters have to pay for that, you know? Uh, should, you know, I don't know who pays for that. These are the kinds of things that need to be resolved. And apparently there's some agreement now between the U.S. and Mexico to kind of resolve some of these issues, but it, it's done at the level of the State Department and the corresponding agency in Mexico, and they've been, they're going to have working groups, and, you know, I don't know. Maybe some of this stuff takes time. I just wish it would be sooner. Um, like John said, I know that there's there are a lot of methane to market uh, places going on, and Nuevo Laredo is doing the same thing. They're converting um, their landfill gas to, to um, electricity as well. And uh, Monterey, of course, is, uh, I've known about that one, but yeah, it's happening all, all along the border. And uh, Allison addressed the issue about the uh, bond markets, but um, it, I, I, I'm always struck by what Paul told me, Paul Ganser, several years ago, that Tijuana had a population of a million, San Diego population of two million, yet the budget for the city of San Diego was two billion dollars with a B, and the budget for the city of Tijuana was 50 million. So you're, you've got these real dichotomies along the border that help create some of these problems. And, you know, one of the problems, uh, you know, if you ask me, one of the big problems for the whole border is that for us in the U.S., the U.S.-Mexico border is one of the poorest regions of the country. Well, from the Mexican federal government's perspective, it's one of the wealthiest parts of the country. You know, they're more concerned about <coughs> Chiapas, Hidalgo, you know, these uh, Morelos, I mean, not Morelos, uh, you know, Michoacan, some of these states on the southern part of, t of, of the country. The country, my understanding is, as you go progressively towards the south and towards Guatemala, it's, it's poor. And so they're, you know, it's hard to get them to cooperate binationally, uh, my experience, on, on some of these issues. Uh, and, and that's the, the trick there. And fortunately for us, we have this La Paz Agreement, which, which commits them to doing this. Uh, and and uh, they work. It's worked well um, for the most part. Well, I would just add to what Steve had to say regarding. It's quite clear that the economic and financial weight of one region compared to the other is there's a tremendous discrepancy, and that I think does indicate the difficulty in doing the kinds of bond issues that I've just heard of for the first time. I mean, it's an interesting concept. I'm sure there are plenty of bankers who would like to help design such a such a project, uh, f financial managers, uh, but but the practicality of it, I, I think, is probably uh, was already uh, uh, underlined in the first intervention. And indeed, uh, we are the Coloso del Norte as far as Mexico is concerned. Of course, Mexico vis-a-vis -vis Guatemala, it's also a Coloso. So these these kinds of economic uh, differentials are, are realities that underpin much of the kinds of issues that we're talking about in these three questions. Now, the, the notion of a federal memorandum of understanding, and I can understand the kind of frustration that would exist after years of trying to, uh, uh, to bring about policies, effectuate policies that, that are reasonable in, in cooperation, but I, I do believe that there probably are, there is some value to looking into, into that possibility. Uh, on the first responder uh, question, I mean, I know that the issues do exist both ways. There's no question. I've, I've read just recently of uh, U.S. Uh, first responders trying to cross the border into Mexico and finding that the lack of a Mexican liability insurance certificate on the vehicle prevented that emergency response vehicle, whether it was a fire truck or a 
uh, or an ambulance uh, for 15 minutes uh, from crossing the border. So, but, so I think a memorandum of understanding, uh, resulting protocols, procedures, uh, attempts to make uh, to increase the kind of cooperation and uh, that that is necessary, that you have a broad understanding and appreciation for the importance of more agile and fluid uh, means of getting equipment and people back across the borders is, is an important thing, and I, 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 I can't see why a memorandum of understanding would, would uh, hurt the process. It may, may not be fast. Might, might I add a little bit to what uh, uh, Mr. Niemeyer was saying about the uh, passport cards? He carries one, I carry one. They're very convenient. Um, we have approximately 200 firefighters, I believe, in the Brownsville Fire Department, and I would venture to say, I don't know how many, but I'm sure that some of them, probably not too many, but some of them were born at home with midwives. And if you've been uh, listening to the news in our area, uh, people born with midwives, even though you know they were born in Texas, in the U.S., their parents may have been in the U.S., born there, uh, definitely U.S. citizens but unable to get passports because they were born at home with a midwife, and perhaps that midwife did not file those records in a timely manner, or there was a, something you know, wrong with the way it was filed, or the wording on it, or whatever. So we have a, a problem in the border area with people who were born with midwives, not just firefighters, but just in general. And that is a big problem that the uh, uh, federal government is trying to work out, and we have seen some improvement, but we still have the problem that continues to exist. Thank you. Are there any more questions or comments from the, uh, from the floor? Um, I'd just like to make one final comment. Um, there is some optimism on the municipal bonds um, uh, issue in that there are organizations that are already looking into the possibility of um, municipal bonds for renewable energy initiatives because, of course, they pay for themselves. You have an income stream coming in um, that will help to, to justify the investment. Um, and increasingly, the specialization of financial firms into not necessarily microfinance but small-scale financing